Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the uh, general meeting of the National Automotive Service Task Force. Uh, I'd like to open up by thanking uh, ETI and Charlie Gorman for allowing us to do our meeting here uh, at the Riviera. Uh, Charlie assured me he's not getting the usual General Services Administration kickback for holding the meeting here at, uh, at the Riviera and uh, in Palm Springs. Uh, I, I think he's missing an opportunity. Uh, but we, we're following a group of interns who've been here and pretty well trashed the place, but you know, it's still uh, presentable enough for us, right? Somebody said we needed a disco ball. Uh, I think that'd be a great addition. Now, this is a great facility and a great time, and there's a lot to be discussed today. We're going to get on with the uh, program, but I wanted to make a couple of general housekeeping announcements. Uh, we have some callers. And I'm going to ask that you mute your phones, and uh, that way we won't have any inter interference while we're in the, uh, in the proceedings here today. And uh, if you need to ask a question, I think you just, yeah. just, uh, just unmute, your phone. unmute your phone and then uh, make, yourself known. Yeah, make yourself known. Just uh, interrupt if you have a question, and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to answer it. Uh, those of you who are in the audience, if you have a question during the proceedings today, uh, please use the microphones. Uh, Scott has agreed to uh, help us with that. He'll uh, cycle through the audience. If you have, just raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. And, and that way, we'll capture the questions and the answers uh, on the recording that we're going to be doing of our session today. Uh, does anyone else have any uh, opening remarks they'd like to make? Because I'm going to uh, move on with the program otherwise. And the first item that we have is our a report from our administrator, Mr. Tony Mullen. Thank you, Ron, and welcome everybody to uh, beautiful sunny Palm Springs. Uh, there have been some changes at NASTIF that I have to report on. Um, as part of the organizational update, um, as some of you may be aware, ALOA, the Associated Locksmiths of America, is no longer managing the secure data release model. They uh, opted to discontinue that service, and as part of the original charter, the management uh, of SDRM has fallen to the Automotive Service Association, ASA. David Lowell, who was working for ALOA, has left that organization and is now the manager of the SDRM, again, working under contract uh, with ASA. So we have managed to have a relatively seamless transmission um, of responsibilities from ALOA uh, to David, and uh, there are still some transitional issues regarding the website that we're working through. But one big change that has been made, the four-party agreement is now a three-party agreement. We have updated it, we've changed the language, and had all three parties sign it, NASTIF, the ASA and the NCIB. All three parties have signed the agreement. They all have their copies, so that, that part of the uh, transition is complete. Again, I had mentioned uh, David Lowell is now the uh, SDRM manager. David will be taking all SDRM questions and inquiries himself. Um, if you have any questions, and the be one of the best ways to do it is probably via email. David's email is uh, S nastifsdrm at gmail.com. So again, n-a-s-t-f-s-d-r-m at gmail.com. And uh, that would be the uh, quickest way to, um, to get in touch with him and get your questions answered. David is in his office Monday through Friday. He works from home on, uh, on Fridays, but he's always available. And uh, if you call the general Nastif number, you will probably get me, and I will refer you to David. Um, as, again, some of you may be aware, last year we announced the search for an executive director. We have had 17 applicants for that position. We have narrowed it down to three finalists, and the NASTIF board will be uh, interviewing the finalists and making a decision in the very near future, at which point NASTIF will again uh, be under the direction of its own discrete uh, executive director. I'm going to go into the SIR report. Um, the service information requests we're getting are running about one to six per month. That six is a high number. I'll give you a little more detail as we move through it. But uh, reprogramming is still the top reason, but security information requests are growing. 
So again, we're still seeing some, uh, some reprogramming issues as the main reason people do file an SIR, but the security information requests are, again, uh, going to be a bigger factor, and you'll hear more about that in one of the other reports. The typical response time from NASTIF to forward an SIR to the OEMs is within 24 hours. Uh, we try to do that actually as soon as they're received. But certainly if it comes in after hours, uh, we do it the first thing in the next day. Uh, OEM response time varies to each request depending on which OEM we're talking about, but by and large they have been responsive. Uh, uh, actually so responsive that uh, when I made this uh, PowerPoint up about a week ago, there were six current unresolved SIRs. There are now only two. The others have been resolved in the week since then, so uh, we are working at it. The oldest one we have is from 2011, still unresolved. Again, it's a theft-related parts issue that I understand is being addressed. And uh, five from 2012, three from April. All of the April ones are closed. They have been responded to. So again, in general, the OEMs are doing a pretty good job of getting back um, to, the, uh, to the ones that file requests. Um, again, TRP is still an issue. Uh, we're going to be working on that. There is a NASTIF uh, Service Information Request Review Committee made up of several volunteers that are reviewing each and every SIR that we get and kind of keeping us honest to make sure that we stay on top of the uh, manufacturers to get a response. We are following up each SIR we do send into the manufacturers with emails the next day. Uh, actually, we usually wait about two days, uh, but certainly within the week uh, if we don't hear back from them. And again, by and large, that's been working. We've been getting lots of, uh, lots of good uh, response from them. A little more detail on what we've been getting. Since um, January 2012, we had one SIR in January, which is closed. Six SIRs are in February. Five of them were closed. It is worthy of note that four of those were invalid requests. Invalid requests can be anything from, how do I change my water pump, uh, to a complaint about the seat angle. I've gotten one of those. Uh, we, use, we respond to every single one we get. We let the uh, respondent or the uh, person who filed the request know that their request is beyond the scope of what NASTIF is and usually give them a, um, a reference to some other source of information. In the case of a service issue like a water pump, we refer them to an information provider. Um, in the case of a bad seat angle, we refer them to the manufacturer. But, uh, but again, for the most part, um, <clears throat> five of those have been closed. Um, Again, four were invalid. One was a uh, valid request that the manufacturer did address. Uh, there were two SIRs in March. One is closed. Actually, both of them are closed. That was one of the ones that I had just gotten back. And the three SIRs in April that are all pending are all closed. So again, the uh, manufacturers are being very responsive. Uh, all three uh, of the ones in April, by the way, are software reprogramming related. So again, reinforces the fact that we've been, uh, we've been getting, a, that's our, still our primary reason why people file one. Uh, again, if you look at the numbers, uh, I said between one and six, one being the low, six being the high since January, but really when you take out the invalids that we inevitably get, we're getting between one and two a month. So it's not a huge uh, number of requests, but again, they are coming in fairly steadily. Um, any suggestions that anyone has, by the way, for us improving the process, we are always open. Uh, please feel free to contact me directly. Um, at tmala at ase.com or simply use the contact uh, address on the NASTIF website. It will get to me as well. You might want to get used to using the contact information. Obviously, when a new executive director takes over, that will change. But again, you can always get to us through the, uh, through the SIR uh, contact or just the general contact on the NASTIF website. Um, and if one other important thing, if you originally joined NASTIF by signing up for the newsletter, uh, you are automatically placed on the general information list. That means notices about general meetings and that sort of thing will come to you automatically. I typically do not send out actual committee meeting alerts uh, except to those who have requested specifically to receive them. Uh, we have a number of committees. If you are interested in any of the NASTIF committees, and there's a list of them on the NASTIF website, uh, please send me an email and I will make sure that you are put on the list to receive that information. Again, unless you do, you will still get general information and general meeting uh, uh, reports and that sort of thing. But again, um, if you want a specific SIR or collision or something along those lines, please let me know and I'll be happy to make sure that happens for you. Um, there will be and have been, uh, all of the presentations that you will see here today will be available shortly on the NASTA Facebook page. If you have not been aware that we have one, we do, and please go there and like us. Uh, but there you will find all of the uh, presentations that you're going to see from this point forward. 
along with information on um, any other developments that NASTIF has. Again, we typically do not post the, uh, the meeting presentations on the uh, NASTIF website. We prefer to use somebody else's bandwidth. But, uh, but again, their, Facebook works great, and uh, Scott Brown has been instrumental in helping us do this, and we applaud him for the, uh, for the efforts. And I would be remiss if I did not thank all of the NASTIF volunteers who, throughout the years, are really the backbone of this organization. All of your efforts have gone to producing what we feel has been a very effective um, system for addressing any information shortfalls that we have, but we could not do it without you. The committees are wonderful. Uh, the folks that uh, are engaged on the board uh, have been nothing but, uh, but passionate about the NASTIF mission. And again, it is through the efforts of all of our volunteers that the organization really comes to life. And, and I thank you, and I'm sure I speak for the board when I say we all thank you uh, for your efforts, and we hope you will continue them. And with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, that concludes my administrative report. Does anybody have any questions that I can answer? S Mark. Mark, I'm sorry. Let's get you a microphone. We want to make sure that we hear you. Um, test, test. Did you not hear the, yeah. the instructions? Mark's not, real big with, Mark's not real big on structure, okay? But Mark, please give us your name, who you are, and what your question is. The, the fact that I heard the instructions doesn't mean I'll follow them. I've, I've been married for a long time, buddy. <laughs> Uh, Mark Warren, um, how is the new general director funded? Uh, the new executive director? Executive director. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, you want me to address that? Each of you will be assessed. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Actually, um, funding is always an issue with any organization, particularly in, in our industry. However, the um, uh, revenues from the SDRM uh, are growing and growing rather well. So uh, we have reached a point where we feel comfortable that the revenues that we will be generating through the SDRM will make an executive director position possible. It is not a lot of money. It is a contract position that we're talking about. Uh, the individual will not receive benefits or any normal type of stuff. So you're basically talking about an independent contractor that will be running the organization. And the costs in doing it that way are very manageable. We feel very comfortable that with the revenues that we're generating from the SDRM that uh, this will not be an issue, okay? Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, Mr. Chairman. As tr uh, true to form, what we're going to do now is we're going to enter into our uh, uh, segment of the meeting where we hear from our committees. And the first committee uh, report I think we're gonna get is the service information Report, which, done. You just did that. which you just handled, right. and then the second one on the schedule is the Vehicle Security Committee uh, report, and I think that's always hastily put together and probably ready. If not, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, hello again to those of you who were here this morning. Uh, we had our uh, annual spring meeting uh, this morning, and. Uh, had an action-packed agenda. Uh, started out um, with uh, some discussion about uh, the SDRM transition to, uh, uh, to ASA management, and since you've already heard about that, I won't go into any more detail on that. Uh, what uh, I don't think you heard a lot about is what the, uh, actually you did cover his responsibilities, didn't you? Yeah, so you've already heard about that too. So uh, the next thing that uh, David Lowell um, talked about this morning was uh, the latest SDRM use statistics, which indicate literally exponential growth year over year in daily transactions. There's also been a recent sharp increase in the number of uh, Mercedes-Benz specialists uh, who've been registering because Mercedes is using SDRM for uh, theft-relevant parts now. Uh, the highlights of the report, there are more than 1,200, actually there's approximately 1,200 LSID holders uh, currently concentrated largely in the states of California, Florida, Texas, and New York. 35% of them are independent repair facilities versus uh, uh, locksmith uh, trades. So we've got a you know, pretty good mix there of uh, independent repair. 
Since February of 2008, uh, transactions have grown more than tenfold. Uh, in February of 2008, there were about 2,300, uh, I'm sorry, 23,000 transactions per year uh, at that time. And uh, in February of 2012, uh, we have gone well over the 235,000 transactions per year mark. Uh, David reported five new suspensions uh, of LSID holders uh, in the last reporting period, and these are all results from the random audits that we announced uh, last, uh, last meeting. And um, the suspensions were all related to uh, failure to follow the uh, secure data release model positive identification policy. Uh, interestingly, none of those suspensions were appealed, which means that uh, apparently those users thought it's too difficult to do the paperwork. So, <laughs> so, uh, so they're out. And uh, the random audits continue. We have certain thresholds that we look at in uh, use patterns. Uh, that will automatically trigger an audit, uh, or the audits will be just random. Uh, TRP, uh, we were supposed to have a representative from Mercedes on the call this morning to give a report on TRP. Uh, we didn't have anybody from Mercedes, and therefore there was no TRP uh, report given. Uh, my understanding is they have significantly expanded their, uh, their parts offerings uh, through SDRM, but that there are still a few parts that are not available uh, through the system. I, I think the fact that we have a lot of Mercedes specialists signing up and using the system indicates to me that uh, it's a useful tool for them and uh, certainly should be useful for Mercedes as well. Uh, National Insurance Crime Bureau report. Uh, Ivan Blackman uh, was here today reporting on uh, activity from the last year. Uh, there were more than 531,000 transactions posted to NICB in 2012. Uh, of those 531 plus thousand transactions, uh, there were 277 vehicles uh, that were reported stolen within uh, seven days of the transaction. Uh, interestingly, of the 277 reported vehicle thefts, 212 of them were associated with dealership transactions, uh, and the remaining 65 were uh, various LSID holders. Uh, another thing that Ivan pointed out to us is that SDRM information has been instrumental in identifying and prosecuting perpetrators in an East Coast theft ring uh, that are responsible for many of those uh, 212 thefts that I just mentioned. Uh, presently, uh, just for your information, Toyota, GM, Nissan, Subaru, and Suzuki post their dealership transactions to SDRM. Uh, I, I think it's, I think it's in something. It's something very important for every car company to consider. Uh, it's a very valuable tool in reducing. The incidence of theft of your vehicles, which will drive your cost of ownership down through lower insurance rates um, and gives your customers peace of mind. So um, that's all Ivan had to share with us. Uh, policy work group, uh, Claude Hensley, my co-chair, reported on uh, uh, policy work group activities and uh, he reported that, quote, our policies are standing the test of time. Uh, as he explained that there have been no policy revisions required since our last meetings. Uh, you may recall we made some fairly significant changes to policy uh, last year, uh, essentially trying to beef up our positive identification policy and also uh, uh, make the system more friendly to, uh, to mobile repair uh, technicians and uh, there were a couple other tweaks we made. Claude suggested that the primary cause for registry suspension is associated with positive ID uh, in enforcement, uh, or I should say positive ID policy enforcement. Uh, random audits have identified several cases of improper uh, requester authority documentation. Uh, that, that's a form that we require be filled out and, uh, and maintained on, uh, on record um, for, what is it, three years, Claude? Two years. Yeah, so uh, when, we audit, um, when we audit a uh, LSID holder, we actually ask them to 
uh, produce paperwork for random transactions, and if they can't produce it, they're suspended. They have the option to appeal to our Security Review Committee, uh, but um, Claude reported that none of the five uh, Alice ID holders appealed their suspensions, as I uh, mentioned before. So the uh, Security Review Committee was like a bunch of Maytag repairmen during this last period. We also had a report from uh, John Norris of uh, the uh, Canadian uh, Automotive uh, Transport Association, CATA, uh, and he gave an update on the Canadian implementation of SDRM. So uh, we are no longer just wait nationwide, we are international. So um, the Canadian version of SDRM is a partnership between uh, the uh, OEMs and, uh, and CATA, uh, Canadian Auto Trade Association, under agreement that they call CASIS, which uh, is an acronym for the Canadian Auto Service Information Standards Agreement. Uh, most of the automakers doing business in Canada have signed that agreement, including BMW and Mercedes. Uh, the Canadian system is currently signing up members uh, to their own version of the uh, Vehicle Security Professional Registry. Uh, Canadian SDRM participants are given a, uh, a vehicle service provider identification number, very similar to our uh, LSID, uh, after they submit certain forms and uh, pass a very stringent background check. Uh, their background check laws are a lot different in Canada, so they do things differently, uh, but they accomplish the same goal. Um, currently, there's uh, a uh, pilot test that's been in operation for some time. There's uh, four locksmith companies that are involved in that pilot and four aftermarket service uh, facilities that are participating. And John continues to work with David Lowell uh, and the automakers to get the program up and running smoothly in Canada, uh, at which point they'll turn it on to all takers. Another thing that uh, David Lowell reported on uh, while he was here was uh, uh, just a, a peek into the future on SDRM funding models. Uh, you know, as, as you have seen uh, meeting after meeting, the growth uh, in the use of SDRM continues to increase. Uh, you hear a lot about uh, theft-relevant parts. Uh, I think we're going to see more of that kind of stuff in the future. And uh, as, the, um, as the load on the system goes up, uh, some of the costs primarily to support uh, go up. So David explained some emerging ideas on how to fund SDRM activities in the future. Uh, as the volume increases and the costs rise. Uh, while, feel, while, while current fee structures are not expected to change anytime soon, the NASDAQ board is looking uh, to the future and future demand as volume grows and also as more uh, TRPs come under SDRM control. Uh, some ideas that are being discussed right now for future funding include uh, very small per fee transactions, uh, they're also looking at volume-based registration fees, essentially based on certain transaction threshold, thresholds. And the NASDAQ board has actually created a uh, subcommittee to study this very important issue. Uh, and all of the members of NASDAQ, uh, both general members and SDRM, uh, or I should say uh, Vehicle Security Committee members, uh, are invited to share their suggestions. We closed our meeting with a couple of excellent presentations today, uh, one of them from uh, Bob Beckman and uh, another one from uh, Claude Hensley. Uh, Bob's presentation uh, uh, essentially outlined how modern vehicle security systems work uh, and some of the issues that aftermarket service providers face supporting security-related repairs. Bob covered uh, various automakers' J2534 capabilities, um, for security systems and how these interfaces relate to uh, programming and or uh, initializing uh, security related parts. Um, the main points that Bob wanted to make in his presentation is that uh, one of the best ways to defund the community of hackers is to give them a 
secure way uh, and a, uh, a monitored way of uh, supporting consumers. Uh, he also wanted to send a message to, uh, to automakers that uh, they can probably save some money by not having to man their own 24 7 365 infrastructure for customers. I think he had some manufacturers in particular in mind there. Uh, and uh, by moving to J2534 support, there's less tool obsolescence and uh, lower, uh, lower long-term legacy costs. So those were Bob's main points. Uh, I thought it was very well done. He certainly made his, uh, his point. And then Claude, um, well, let's see. This is where I was still writing. Okay, so <laughs> um, Claude's presentation uh, showed that, that a majority of automakers uh, are cooperating uh, very well with NASDAQ uh, in supporting the locksmith industry. Uh, and I think his main points were uh, that the locksmith industry supports many hundreds of thousands, probably millions of, of consumers out there over time. Uh, and uh, I think his, uh, to, to quote one of his slides, we want to get them on the go rather than on the toe. So the best way to get them on the go is to give them a secure way to get to the information that they need. Um, and he also pointed out that beginning in 2013, uh, with the sunset of some exceptions that were in the uh, California Migden bill, uh, that we can expect some greater participation, uh, primarily from some European automakers. And um, I think that covers the essence of uh, Claude's presentation. And uh, I have run out of notes, and I think I've also run out of agenda, which means I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And it's always uh, it's nice that you uh, take on the task of assembling those right after the meeting and presenting them while they're hot and fresh, right? Our next uh, report will be the Tool and Equipment uh, Committee report, and that's going to be delivered by Donnie Cyber. He's the co-chair of that group. Welcome, Donnie. Good afternoon. Very good. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just have a few things. Won't take much time, um, so I'm just going to kind of run through them. These are activities that we've been working on sort of in an ongoing basis, and um, there's the four things, and we'll just run through them real quick. Um, we've been working on a scan tool matrix that is basically designed for end users, and the reason for developing it is these things that we've all come up with. A lot of questions about what tools are appropriate to use for which vehicle, where to find and buy a tool, what hardware is required as far as computers and, and interface and all of that sort of information how to determine what features are offered in the OE tool so that when you're comparing to an aftermarket tool, you can decide whether the feature set's actually what you're looking for and, and at what level do you need to dive in for a particular manufacturer you may service and to help to fill a perceived information gap so that we can work on the real ones. Um, a lot of the requests that come through, as many of you have seen because you get these emails, are things that, that some of us are well aware are already out there and others aren't. So if we can sort of streamline that, that makes it nice. So who's been working on this? Um, the Automotive Service Association's Mechanical Operations Committee agreed to take on the process of turning these tools into a feature set. We've had a lot of help from many of the OEs and most of you are in the room who've helped us with that to uh, identify what feature sets were in the tool to begin with. And then our guys kind of went through and modified a Excel spreadsheet that we discussed on one of our conference calls and all looked at uh, to create something that fit that particular tool. So there isn't an identical sheet for every tool because some tools have different features. So um, that's one of the things. Uh, we also have had volunteers that have helped us who read a press release that Advanced Art put out for us and uh, that's been helpful too because we've gotten a broader um, group of folks to help both uh, aftermarket tool manufacturers and technicians who are not on the operations committee. So that sort of gave us a wider range of folks. 
We've also had um, some texts from dealers who volunteered to help who saw the post on IATN. And uh, so we've got, on average, two to three at least reviews per tool, and that includes some of the more out there tools. Uh, we've actually got a review of the Maserati tool. Um, and, and all this stuff is, is compiled and basically ready to go. Um, we're up to basically 2011, so that's as far forward as we've gone. So if there have been software updates and things like that, we know that this is going to be a moving target. So we just kind of said, here's the line in the sand, and then we'll add to it as we go along. Um, ultimately, our goal is to not only make it available as a matrix, but make it available so that techs who are using the tools can comment and add their own information to it. Um, that'll take a little bit more web programming than what we're going to start with. Um, we're ready to publish this information, and uh, Charlie's offered to allow us to use a tool that he's got on his website that we will then link it back into the NASDAQ um, site, and uh, the whole idea being that it's fairly easy to set up so that we don't have a bunch of programming time involved, and, and um, uh, the operations committee thought that was a swell idea. So. So what will it look like? Um, this is sort of um, an idea that we had on one of our conference calls, and um, I just used the Ford tool because this is the one we used, um, because a lot of the tools have this sort of mode going where we've got an interface, a laptop, and, and the car. Um, the idea is to provide a, a picture of what the thing looks like and what equipment's involved in it, its coverage, what kind of uh, uh, hardware you need, all the things that we talked about on the front end, here are the first things that, that I brought up. We want to put that in there. But the real meat and potatoes of it is, is this part. Um, and this is just simply going down features. Now, again, this is kind of for that Ford tool. When we did the Honda tool, we had a completely different set of specs because it's a different tool. And that's the whole intention. And the, and the folks that are using the tool are, are writing the matrix have actually used the tool, so it's not arbitrary. And then there's an opportunity for them to make some comments. Now, those comments may be, before you can do this, you have to do this, um, or that it needs an extra piece of equipment, as in the case with Ford and their VMM. So um, the, the one that's blanked out there was we were going to review it, but we decided, um, the folks that were on the call, and there were quite a few of us, it was just a little bit too arbitrary. There was really no way to say, how good is this or how bad is it, depending on the user's abilities and how many times they've used it. So. We nix that whole idea. Um, the other little project that we got done, and it was little because it happened extremely fast, is we agreed that we wanted to update the who at the manufacturer is the guy to contact or the gal to contact when you need information about a tool. And this came out of a couple of conversations we had where things had gotten decidedly a little sideways because we were talking to the wrong people. and. Um, ETI provided their list. I emailed it out to all of the folks on the Tool and Equipment Committee, and within 72 hours, we had every OE had responded and said, this is the new person to contact, or this is the same person, or whatever the case it may be. Even some of them came back with details about for this go here, for that go there. So that list will be jointly maintained by the new NASTAF director, and um, ETI will also be keeping that list so that it's always current, so that if there's a, if somebody learns, one or the other learns about a change, we'll try to keep that current so that if you have a contact need, now there will be somebody that you can go to. Um, we also had a conference call where we talked about the tool information request, and we had a lot of folks on the line, so this was a great opportunity to sort of get consensus on this. And what we agreed was that we would use the existing SIR process, and Charlie, if I get any of this wrong, just jump up and correct me, um, to resolve tool information requests. Um, we also decided that there really didn't make a lot of sense to completely redesign another form, because most of us could make the leap that you'd put the information you needed on the SIR form, and everybody could figure out what was there. Um, so rather than doing a bunch of superfluous programming, we decided we'd just use the same form. So when those things, if those things come up, for a tool maker that needs information, they can use this, and then um, the director will make sure it gets to the right people, presumably with our new nifty list. Um, and then just a request from both Greg and I, if you have things that are of concern or that you'd like for us to understand, particularly me, Greg lives in this world, I don't. I repair cars, I turn wrenches, and I teach. 
but people ask me questions all the time. So if you've got things that you know are going on, feel free to share them, even if it's a press release or something like that, so that when we get questions, we can make sure that we're giving them the right answers and something current. And that's all I've got. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Donnie. Um, I think it is uh, important to note that as the service information, the peer service information requests are dwindling down to uh, a few because most of the service information that we all need uh, to repair cars is available. And, and most of what we're learning is that uh, we're, we're moving into areas uh, that originally weren't in the uh, NASTA charter, so to speak. But this area of tool and equipment information and uh, uh, theft related parts, security uh, information, and all of those other uh, topics that are obviously on our agenda now may be uh, the future of this organization and we have to adapt and, and uh, be prepared to address everything as in uh, Mark's admonition to us uh, to be service uh, ready when uh, the vehicle comes into the bay. So I think these are all uh, uh, great developments.